Welcome to the Women in Business radio show with Sean Murphy, connecting women in business around the globe. Hello and welcome into the Women in Business radio show studio. I'm so excited to welcome back my co-host Laura Lawrence from all ages and ages ago. Welcome back into the studio. It is so <laughs> nice to be here. In fact, I was just checking. It has been three years since you I was last are, in the You're joking. I know. Well, the, the main thing I've noticed is that I actually have to wear my glasses now. <laughs> Looking at all the paperwork <laughs> for our show today, which, which didn't happen three years ago. But, um, but apart from that... I don't think much has changed. I, 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 rem I just remember everything as it was. Yeah, it, uh, stuff just comes back, doesn't it? Straight, up, straight away. It's almost like you haven't been away. And we're going to be welcoming Laura back into the studio. Every now and then, Laura's going to be visiting as a co-host. I can't so, and I think you're back into the studio on the 30th of March, aren't That's you? That's right, yes, yes. yes. It's, uh... So, who have we got? Our guest today is Karen Barrett. She is the CEO and founder of Un Unbiased. And we are going to be talking about, well, all sorts of things, finance. We're going to be talking to Karen about money for women in business, money for women, dispelling some of the myths around that, but also talking to Karen about setting up her business. And let's have a look. So, Karen is the founder and CEO of unbiased.co.uk, the leading platform connecting people to professional financial advisors, mortgage advisors, accountants, uh, financial advisors, coaches and products. She is the Great British Business Women of the Year finalist for 2021. She's the Scale Up Entrepreneur of the Year finalist for 2021 as well and 19th place in the JP Morgan Private Bank Top 200 Female Powered Businesses. Wow. That's not, not bad going, is okay, it? Okay, so, <laughs> so by the time she leaves here, nothing left of her. Brain, <laughs> brain and empty husk. So welcome, Karen. Hopefully we have Karen on uh, in the air with us. Can you hear me, Karen? Yes, I'm here. It's uh, great to be on the show. Hello. Brilliant. Welcome to the studio, Karen. Thank you so much for connecting with us today. So we haven't actually gone, by, gone through and sort of come up with a firm topic of what we're going to be discussing, mainly because there's so much that you have done, so much experience that you have that you've brought both to your own business, but also to help support um, women in, in finance, that it was difficult to sort of narrow something down, to be honest. So if you're happy, we are just going to get going and see what happens and see what comes out. Yeah, that's good for me. Fire away. Oh, brilliant. And I see on Instagram, your Instagram profile I absolutely love it is a lady doing it all yes that is and my family take the mick out of me they're like lady doing nothing if only they knew um I'm impressed at my intro I sound I sound um you know definitely more exciting than I currently feel on a day-to-day -day basis but it's always good to look back and and sort of celebrate your successes which I think many people running their own businesses or even just you know working hard um in their jobs sometimes don't do enough you know look back and go oh my gosh I've come so far I've done x y and z so it's nice to take that moment and listen to you uh, reading the intro of me well I'm going to I'm going to read a little bit more in a moment I'm going to read some of your your mission but I just wanted to come back onto something that you said which was that that sounds an awful lot more excited than I feel sort of every day and I think there are so many of us that are like mm. that aren't they we, we sort of put these things together as women very often and we write these things and then when you look at it and you you, you sort of you put that together with what you may do every day or how you feel or when you're in your family environment or whatever it is in your real life if you like that sometimes the two don't don't quite don't match up do they and I think is that a little bit of imposter syndrome maybe I wonder yeah I don't know I think for me it's very much um I'm just very future focused mm, and ah, there's okay. always more to do and the next yeah. hurdle and barrier to get through um I definitely think that having grown the business um, that's part of our culture now to celebrate success because actually that's motivating mm. that you want to do more of that feeling, that good thing, you know, that I've, uh, I've achieved. So, um, I mean, gosh, way back when, when I started Unbiased, I definitely think it was a little bit of imposter syndrome. So I was relying quite heavily on Google, you know, what does a CEO do? You know, how do I do this? How do I create the board? And what does a non-exec, you know, what's yeah. their role? Um, but clearly as you you know you're in the role and you're doing doing something again and again you get you get you, used you, to it so yes. 
Well, what you, your, your business mission is, it says, Unbiased is on a mission to empower everyone to make confident financial decisions and has developed the UK's most powerful search tools for connecting consumers with the widest available choice of advisors and financial products to date. And I'm, I, 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 I'm bowing down to you now as I read this next bit out. To date, the site has helped over 20 million people make smarter and more confident financial decisions. Yeah, that's wow. right. Well, wow. I, I think, look, yes, I, I, the, the, the thing is that there's a real need, right, mm. for financial advice. Um, it's not something that everyone feels is almost relevant to them. I think there's a myth that, you know, you have to be really wealthy and live in a big mansion, some sort of Downton Abbey-esque manor house or whatever it is to, um, for financial advice to be relevant to you. And at Unbiased, we want to help people understand that planning their finances will make them feel more confident. And I think really our site wants to empower everyone to make confident financial decisions, whatever it is they're trying to do. The problem in the UK is that we've got you know, an aging demographic. We've got lots of baby boomers with wealth um, from property price increases and great pension plans. And that group of people is growing. We've got people trying to get on the housing ladder, and that's more and more difficult, as I'm sure your listeners will mm. understand. And then you've got things like cost of living crisis that, you know, are, are really hurting everyone's pockets. And how can you continue to invest for sort of longer term and pay your mortgage, et cetera, and just manage your money? And I think Unbiased is really well situated to help lots of those people because the financial advisors that we connect them with they see this stuff day in, day out. They're, they're qualified and they're regulated. So really, Unbiased, in its first instance, was about connecting people with experts who were trusted and could actually sort of hold your hand and take you through the process. Um, and the site has been really successful, I think, in doing that, but also in providing lots of content and guides and just information to people around the process. So lots of people worry about what is it going to cost? How much money do they actually have to have for it to be relevant to them? Um, and so we cover all that information and those questions. And we even do things like provide questions. If you're going to see a financial advisor, here's a list of five things to get the conversation going and just really make people feel a little bit more at ease. It's like anything you haven't done before. You've always got that little bit of trepidation. Yeah. So, um, and then the site sort of growing a bit in terms of we want to come up with other solutions. So that's where the coaching or the you choose your own product on the site. We know that not everyone wants financial advice for everything or at all times. Um, so we're just looking really to help people get involved with managing their money and feel more in control of it mm. rather than their money ruling their lives. So, Karen, so it's great have, to have helped so many people. Have you noticed, um, you know, sort of an upturn in, in people sort of seeking help from you over the last couple of years, particularly, as you mentioned, we've got the cost of living crisis um, and, and people, people's lives have been impacted in, in such ways that, that you know, it, it has changed. So there's been a trend ever since I set up the business, really, for more people to seek financial advice. And I think there's a couple of things driving that. One, as I said, that the mortgage market's uh, difficult. It's more difficult to get a mortgage and to pass those affordability checks. Of course, there was COVID. So people, you know, it, we went very quiet for a bit. And then people came back to us in a rush almost going, well, life doesn't stop. And I've still got these big financial decisions to make. And it's interesting because we help people with decisions that really impact their families and their loved ones. You know, people want to ensure that should they die, that their spouse can ensure to keep a, a roof over their head or them, their parents are getting ill and frail. Have they sorted out care fees and, you know, a way for them to be looked over after in their older age? So very much the, the decisions that people want to make about their finances are actually what I call big life decisions that are actually family and lifestyle decisions. And that doesn't go away because of COVID and, you know, uh, people work their whole lives to build up pension pots, et cetera. And then they get to sort of D-Day and they, oh my gosh, this is a big, important decision I need to know, make and I, I want to get some help doing it. It was interesting. There was a program on last week about pensions um, and we had one of our busiest days ever. The traffic to the site was just massive. And I think for, for us, it underlines that 
people really do need mm. bespoke help when it comes to the more difficult and complicated financial decisions. People can set up savings and open a bank account and, and do those things with either information from the web or um, you know, from friends and family. But when it gets to the, the more difficult stuff, uh, they want help, they want an advisor, and we are definitely, to answer your question, seeing increased numbers of people doing that year after year. Karen, what I want to do, I want to get a little bit of your story, a little bit of your background, um, so that we can share with listeners how you started out, how you got to where you are now. So can you can you tell us yeah. that? Okay, so um, I first uh got a job out of university that was in um, financial services. I had been temping, actually, for Camelot, the lottery people, and I had visions of, you know, doing something exciting in marketing um, for them, but they wouldn't have me. So here was I applying for jobs, and I, I took a job at a mortgage provider uh, that was actually in the process of closing down on a one-year contract uh, just because it paid more than the job I was currently in. Um, but I got there, and the business was probably about 200 people large, which is smallish. Um, and I really enjoyed my time there. And actually, they um, were a really innovative mortgage lender. And during the time there, their fortunes changed. And actually, they stopped winding the business down and started selling again because the product that they had um, were actually flying off the shelves. Um, and I think that was really, you know, my first taste of a smaller organization that gets stuff done and that people have autonomy mm. to make decisions. And very critically, the Internet was just a thing then, sort of 1999. Um, and I was one of those people that plugged a computer into the Internet for the first time because I worked in marketing and getting content onto a site. Um, and for me, this was really interesting. This was oh, here's a new way of doing things, of getting information um, to people. And I remember in my lunchtime, I would get people coming up because I had one of the computers. You know, not every computer had access to the internet. Um, and helping people book holidays via teletext website. And it was just, <laughs> I'm remember. starting to see. Do you remember teletext <laughs> yes. holidays? Yes, I like, yes. put the numbers in. It was laborious. <laughs> you know, your TV would take forever to look at oh, these ads. I think oh. I've even booked one. Have you booked one of them? Yeah, <laughs> y yes, years and years, and yes. <laughs> I had a friend who actually worked for the teletext holidays side of things, you know, so um, I feel like I'm, I'm in a time warp. It's, uh, I know, I'm those, sorry, everyone. We're really old. We're showing our age. <laughs> Well, no, I think it's quite important. I think it's also it's really interesting sometimes to sort of get reminded and jolted back to yeah, how, how you did things. Yes, to how these things started because now, you know, I don't know about you, but I open up a little MacBook and if what I want hasn't sprung into life yeah, and done, exactly. I've done something in about two seconds less, actually I'm I'm starting to you know, bash on the keys and I'm starting to get cross. And I remember the teletext sort of, mm -hmm. it used to load like a little, is, is it like a, a ticker tape? Maybe it just chunk, 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 coming yeah. out bit by bit, yes. <laughs> yeah, it, it was quite difficult. But, you know, where, when did they go? I can't remember when actually they I went out of business in the I internet, you know. can't remember. Can't remember. Uh, probably in the two, early 2000s sometime. Yeah. Um, but it was at that point a different way of getting information out to large numbers of people. And that was of interest to me. Um, but to move on, I moved on to Abbey National at the time uh, to manage some of their retail savings and investments. I stayed there, I think, about two years. Um, I learned it wasn't for me in a large organization. I found there was a lot of red tape. It all sort of felt like I was back at school that you'd do a paper or have an idea and it would go up to different layers of people to almost get marked and come back down. So um, that was a great experience in helping <laughs> me understand what worked for me and what didn't. You're, you're taking um, me back to the whole corporate thing where my, I spent yeah. marketing in, in the corporate. And by the time a document did get back to you after everyone had put their sort of two, two bit into it, it was out of date and you had to then go and rewrite it and start start again. And it was just like so frustrating. Uh, and that is, isn't that the truth? And the other oh. thing I found was that it, uh, things took so long, it could be six months. And then they'd sort of, you'd forget about it. And maybe a few months later, it would come in from someone else, almost as someone else's idea. And it would just be exasperating for me. I, you know, I yes. wanted to have an impact and I wanted to have an idea and make it work for them. You know, I really did, wanted to work hard. And it's quite interesting now when I look at who works for Unbiased, I can see a group of people with the same attitude. You know, they want to get things done. There's a real passion yeah. and immediacy and motivation. Um, 
that wasn't there in my experience anyway of, of the corporate world. Mm. So it was a great experience. You know, I, I um, had some great colleagues there um, and made some great friends and also re, uh, reaffirmed to me I was still interested in technology and I was still interested in finance. I thought it was a really interesting sector um, to work in. Um, I then went and looked for purposely for a small business uh, to join and um, I joined a business that promoted IFA called, funnily enough, IFA Promotion. And it was almost like the precursor <laughs> to Unbiased. Um, but it was very sort of, again, traditional in terms of um, pay, ads in papers, um, e- not email, door drops and, and mailings out to people, um, very much around getting people to understand why an independent financial advisor might lead them mm. to better outcomes um, and that they should call and have a chat but no focus whatsoever on data and understanding, you know, journeys and different needs of people and um, really understanding through data what people wanted and how you could then answer that need. So um, as, um, as I worked there for, I think, about nine years, um, I climbed my way through the ranks marketing manager, marketing director, and pretty much was um, running the whole marketing side of things. Um, I had my second child, and um, he was born with a critical heart condition, um, which clearly was a big surprise. It hadn't been diagnosed before his birth. I've got three children now, but this was my second. Um, And he was just difficult for a month. And anyway, he ended up being taken to hospital and going through two open heart surgeries. And I had had an extended stay in hospital um, and during this time, I suppose I was like a doctor uh, uh, who smokes and drinks in that I'd worked in finances and, you know, knew about wills and life insurance and payment protection and all the rest of it, but hadn't really taken my own advice for a long time. So yeah. at that point in my life, I was thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, we had two earners in our household and our, our finances depended on that. What if I couldn't go back to work because I was... Um, caring for my son. How long was this going to last? Was this a temporary measure or longer term? Um, and I was looking for advice at that point, and my friends and family didn't have advisors that that, need, that gave the type of advice mm. that I, I needed. So it was at that point that um, the idea for Unbiased was born. Um, and luckily, my son recovered. Um, he's now 14. Um, and uh, I realized then that other people would be going through the same sort of epiphanies in, mm. as in, oh, my gosh, I need to sort something out that's big and it's impactful for, for my family. And I want the right advisor for me and for my particular situation. I don't really think that, you know, my mom or my neighbor has the same experience as me and wants the same things in terms of advice. Um, and given my experience in, um, you know, having run the tech side of companies and marketing and having worked in financial services, all my sort of experience and, and um, skills led me to, well, I can do this. I can, I can set up unbiased and we can focus on the data and connecting people simply and easily and finding them advice that's right for them. Um, and I also think that you talked about confidence earlier on that having nearly lost my son and him recovering just took away any sort of worry I had about getting it wrong or failing. I just thought, you know, I don't care. I've faced the worst thing that could possibly happen to me. If I fail in a business and have to get another job, wherever it is, that's absolutely fine. I don't really care. What's what's, the big big deal? Yeah, what's the worst that could happen? It means I just have to go and get another job, you know. And it really also... You know, it played out later in my career in terms of work-life balance. You know, I, I am now responsible for sort of 85 people that we employ and we set a culture in our business and I'm a mother and I want to be there for my family, but I also care about my business because I love it and I mm-hmm. love what I do and I love providing the service that helps other people make those good decisions around their finances in their life. So it has helped me in terms of the work-life balance you know, come naturally because I do want to put that time aside for my family and friends and things that I enjoy doing. And I do want to um, work and I love what I do in my work. I love the people I work with um, and and what we're producing and creating. So that balance, I think, has been more natural to me than it might have been had I not gone through the sort of uh, abrupt experience of, um, of Dominic's early, early life. 
I just want to come back onto a couple of a couple of points, just some things that sort of stuck out for me. One of them is how it was your lifestyle. So it was the fact that you wanted to build resilience in um, to the way that you were as a, a working mum um, and running a business that sort of dr drove you forward into your business and how that also seems to me to be the, the connection for your client, for the clients of unbiased, which is you're providing something that fits in with their lifestyle. And you've joined the financial advice side of it really very much to what's going on in people's lives, which when you say it like that now, it actually seems quite obvious. But I'm not sure that it's been that ingrained in financial advice in the past. So it was really I, just how... I. I just think that that's such a key thing that you've mm. done there. Um, and, and the other thing that, that sort of occurred to me, uh, having been in corporate myself and how I suspect you have taken this out of your business, is how um, in corporate we come up against people who sort of job depends on them having to review stuff, slow stuff down and basically spend time churning it over. And if they just give it a cursory glance and let it go they actually don't have a job and so it's sort of like the job creation and maintenance that we sometimes find built into corporate that slow everything down yeah um, absolutely and, and if that's something that you consciously stripped out yeah okay so starting with your uh, sort of first um comment or question around um you know financial lives being important um i think i've been on that journey of understanding that is mm. actually what's happening i think when i started out i was definitely you know the pr around well this is the best interest rate and how much does advice cost for each yeah. you know, if you want to do different things this is the pound value and over time i've just thought you know what this isn't what matters mm. to people you know, and having been through that experience myself, what mattered to me was that I could keep paying a mortgage and keep a roof over our heads and that we would flourish as a family and, you know, be able to go on a holiday maybe mm. and feed our kids, etc. And that it made me think to the future around, OK, well, have I got life assurance? And if I was to, to pass away, have we got wills and have we set out the future for our family and I, I knew and felt very personally that this was my life I was managing it wasn't about the rate I'm getting on my pension or an investment mm. account etc or how much I had in a savings account now that is important right that, yes. that that makes up some of the narrative around things you don't want to be paying more tax or you don't want to get a rubbish savings rate if you've got money in the bank etc but but that's not what it's about it's about feeling confident that you've made the right decisions it's feeling you've done the right thing and you've got your ducks in a row should the worst happen so that you can get on with the rest of your life which is a really good which is a really good lesson isn't it for anybody in business because the the interest rates and all of that sort of thing is really quite mm -hmm. granular isn't it and i think it's very often where we default to as, as a business person we focus on the real detail of what we're doing yeah. when i think what you're saying is actually yeah that of course that matters you need to make the right decision but what really really matters what people are really concerned about we need to chunk it up and we need to chunk it up into well, how does this actually change their life um, and basically sort of go upwards and be more strategic when we're talking to people and thinking about what they want yeah absolutely I think that um, that's why financial advisors are really helpful actually because they can cut through this is these are the decisions yeah. you need to make that are important and the priority right you could you could probably spend your whole day planning your finances and managing your money etc but no one has the time for that mm. and a financial advisor can see where you are at your life stage they know what's coming on down the track typically and they know the quick sort of shortcuts for you to like that all you do i know you haven't got all day karen but just make the, these two decisions and get back to me and i'll get back to you in a couple of months mm. when you've had a bit of time and i'll ask you for that third decision etc right they're there to help you and just mm. support you and i think you know people can get bogged down with the minutiae it's interesting yeah. we've got two ways that people can find advisors on our site one's a directory and one's you put in seven bits of information about yourself and our algorithm matches you and within 60 seconds you've got a match. Now, the large proportion of people that come to our site go through that second way because you don't want to get, how are you going to choose between advisor A yes. and B and C? You don't have the information yet. 
Some people want to go on the directory. Mm. And I know what it's like, even if I'm booking something fun like a holiday, you, you, know, you go on the holiday website and you put in your little, where do you want to go and what's the dates and you use the little counter on the left-hand side. Typically, by the end of that process, I'm like, oh, my God, just let me get this yeah, book. So, just right, so I can only imagine how <laughs> yeah. bad it is when it's doing something like organising your pension. Yeah. You know, you'll lose the will to live and lose your intent. So we really just want to get people who, you know, who are like, right, I need to sort my finances. Get them in front of an advisor, helping them make those decisions, making it simple for them, making it clear. And just go, oh, that's great. Let me look after it, you know, and, and help people on with their lives. So it's about mm. making the right decision at a life level, also just letting them get on with their lives. And that's why an advisor, you know, can keep an eye on the markets and what you're doing and say if you move job or you have a, another child, et cetera, uh, more, move houses, oh, now's a good time to look at X, Y, and Z. So I, I definitely think that it, it, it's about life decisions. It's not about the interest rate or, you know, the yes. percentage. Laura, I think that, I mean, I think that's a brilliant idea because I know so often when I've needed to sort of review mortgages and, and you know, my, my mm-hmm. own finances, it's like, well, who shall I go to, you know, because you sort of listen to your friends and they say, oh, well, so and so is good and so and so is good. But actually to have an algorithm that just actually matches me to what all my needs are, would just then mean that I'll get something done sooner. Mm. So uh, That's absolutely it. And, you know, that's what we see with the, the tens of thousands of people who come to our site um, on, on a daily basis. They, they just want to get the job done, and I, I don't blame them. Yeah. And then moving on to your second um, comment about corporate, um, it wasn't so much that I've actively look to remove that from my business i think it's the fact that when you're small and when i set up the business we had seven people you know within a few months which was tiny uh you cannot hide you know you know what everyone's doing and everyone's doing a job and a half because you haven't got enough people and even at the size that we're at now 85 people i feel like a sort of headmistress i know all their names (laughs) i know what they do i hopefully know something about their family situation i don't know when i'm gonna like fail and I've got two people mixed up lately and I think that's almost a sign of success as in gosh we've got such a big team now I can't um, remember I really, them all <laughs> I know I can't remember hey you know we're doing great I can't remember who we're employing but no um, I do like to know all their names and something about them but what we specifically do know is they have a unique function and we couldn't do without that person yeah um, and it's like many little cogs in a in a machine of which i am just one small cog i can you know it, i might be ceo and founder but i certainly cannot run the business and do all the things we do without all of the people and i absolutely can have a conversation with every individual about what they're working on and what they're doing and i think when you get to the sort of corporate level particularly as a large you know thousands of people and different functions and teams and verticals and however the structure is of course things are going to get lost and people you know the paper shufflers or the people whose job is to turn stuff over they're going to get overlooked um and i feel sort of sad for them because you get one life you want to make it as happy as possible if you're going to have to work um do, yeah. do something you love if you can you know i understand certainly situations where people don't have that luxury but if you can choose make it something that you do love because it's such a big part of your life and hopefully you're going to excel in your career and have some pride in it and want to grow and learn. And I definitely think that's a culture that we've tried to um, make it unbiased in terms of understanding who are we as a business and what people fit. And so it's interesting in interviews, you know, the CV doesn't matter so much anymore. Is this person passionate? Do they care? Do we get on? Are they going to fit in as much as yes. for us yes. as for them yeah. or for them as for us? Um, so I definitely, that, you know, that corporate thing is very mindful um, when I'm hiring. You know, if someone's been, uh, you know, boy and man in a in a corporate, they're possibly not for us unless they've had a... Sort of, yeah, some sort of epiphany or something. Yeah, epiphany <laughs> of I want to do stuff differently. Um, but also I think it's interesting we're very diverse. So the business, when I set it up, um, was just diverse because of the original hired hiring criteria I had and the skill set I got in. And then I think those people hired almost in their likeness. So I'm really proud mm. that uh, um, C-suite is 50% um, female. Um, and, of course, diversity is not just about gender. It's lots of different things and I look across the business and I love the fact that we are so diverse because I think it really does help us reflect our you our customers 
um, you know, needs and, and what they might be thinking of. Um, yeah. I just, so, sorry, it's quite difficult. I say we've got Karen. Karen is on the phone, which means it's quite difficult. We can't see each other. So sometimes the conversations um, sort of we cross over each other, but I'm sure it's all forgiven. Um, I, what I wanted to do was you've, you've mentioned a few times um, about you, how you started off and you had seven people and now you've got 85. And the book that you recommended, one of the books that you most influenced you, you would give as a gift is Scaling Up by Vern Harnish. And you're saying it opened your eyes to ways of growing faster. And I wonder, can you just take us through your your growth journey from when you started up, um, just perhaps the key points as to, to where you are now and how you got yeah. there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the growth of the business was pretty low, I would say, probably for the first five years. You know, we were sort of ticking over. Um, we probably employed another one or two people up to about sort of 2015, um, partly because I was growing my family at the time um, and partly because something hadn't sparked in me in terms of that this sort of mega growth almost was possible and actually the the service that we were providing was actually really good. Now I first clocked this when you know we had lots of referrers for people with links back to our site from their site and they were great brands you know currently We've got people like product providers like Royal London or Standard Life and Legal in general. And they were sending people through to us. We're on the um, .gov site um, that where if people are checking their pension contributions or need to do anything, people are sending them to unbiased. And at the time, I was like, oh, look at all these people, you know, whether it's Witch or Good Housekeeping mm. or Red Magazine. And they were saying, if you need a financial advisor, go to unbiased. Um, and I think that was because I had set out to have the biggest – number of financial advisors who were regulated on our website, which gave consumers the biggest choice and the best match, back to what I was talking about earlier, you know, the best match for for their needs. Um, And I've been working really hard on creating what I saw as a good business. And I didn't exactly know what a good business was, was, but it was a number of things. It was having a good brand. It was having employees who were happy. It was having customers who were happy. And it was providing a service to people that was actually of need. And it was almost like I got to a point, I had my third child, and I got to about 2015. I looked around and thought, wow, we're, we're really getting connections from some great brands here. And we're getting more customers and almost the sort of the snowball effect of our growth had been small, but we were getting bigger and there was almost a tipping point. So around 2015, um, we had outsourced our sort of web build and data to an external company. And um, at that point, I thought, no, no, we need to take this all in-house rather than outsourcing it so we can have more control of it. Mm. So in, in the years of about 2015 to 2017, what we did was, I call it replatforming the business, but we took all our data and services and put them onto um, a web environment that we owned and that we managed. Um, so I was hiring tech people at that time. Um, and of course, you always have to balance this with how much money am I making? How much does it cost me to get a new person in? And when am I going to see an up uplift in revenue? So the smaller you are, it is difficult to grow fast, but you've got to plan it and and keep your eye on the fact that every part of extra revenue you make, you're going to invest that back in the business into growing some more. Um, in around sort of 20, so we did that successfully um, and took all our, our tech and data in-house effectively, which meant that we were hiring more people on our own payroll. Um, and then it's from about 2017, 2018, my eyes were open to the uh, f- funding landscape and the fact that you could get investment from external companies that was pretty significant um, to help bolster your growth. So I went out and hired in someone who knew around, uh, knew about how to get those deals happening and had the right contacts and also could support us financially in providing the right information and, and forecasts for our business. So what metrics were we um, delivering in terms of sort of revenues and margins and what did we need to look like and what was the future going to look like? Um, and I also hired in a CTO or a chief technology officer because we had really moved into the, the realms of being a, a subscription business, which we called SaaS, um, and we were B2B. So it's software mm-hmm. as a service and we were B2D and it needed sort of new tech to support that because some of the services we offer offer are very self-serve and on the website. 
And in 2019, uh, we were successful. Um, at the very end of 2019, we raised just over five million. Um, and we were very excited about this. Um, this was going to revolutionize the amount of people that we could show the service to and grow our customer numbers um, and users of the service. And then, of course, COVID struck two months after that, so in March, after we'd raised the funds. Um, but it was great during that time, one, to have the funds in the bank because we had a very strong um, idea about what work we needed to do. So we didn't furlough anyone. I think we hired 35 people during the next 12 months, and they all worked hard on the product and the products that we offer. And we came out with a new suite of products to help people manage during COVID. It was great, and I felt very fortunate, actually, that the business I'd created was online, you know, no stores that people couldn't visit, yes, no yeah. stock, no, none of those issues that lots of businesses had. We were very much able to continue and, and shop was open because it's a website, it's 24-7. So it means, you know, if you have a night shift and you want to find an advisor at 7 in the morning when you knock off, for example, you can do that. Advisors can accept consumer inquiries at any time of the day. Advisors and, and customers could speak to each other over Zoom or Teams or whatever it was, and that they could continue to provide advice. So I felt very fortunate that actually we were in that in that space. Um, another thing that was highlighted to me during that point was because we have subscription revenues, um, we could plan with some certainty our future. Whereas I know that for some businesses, revenue sort of either stopped or went really high and then stopped you know it was just yeah. a very unpredictable time you know we typically have seasonal trends where people find, look for advice between the beginning of January when they come out with their new year's resolutions and the end of the tax year at the beginning of April that's our busy period and then we flatline for the rest and it just went crazy you know there was the stamp duty uh, the housing market is shut and then there was the stamp duty holiday so it was all stop and then it was start again um, and then we had uh, people with pensions, they came back in the summer, whereas they hadn't been looking for an advisor in the beginning of the year. Um, and so we, we got through it really, really well. Um, and whether it was luck or, or being smart that we, we did the fundraise when we did, that we were protected mm. um, from COVID and effectively were on plan for where um, we wanted to be. And then in last October, um, we raised some more money, um, another five million, because we looked across the pond to the U.S. and couldn't see anything that was like our proposition um, so that anyone that used sort of data and the algorithm that we have in the same way and also the way we connect consumers to advisors, but then also help those advisors onboard and convert those clients into customers of their own. There was no... Um, we, we have tools on our platform for advisors who um, use us, like pipeline conversion tools or APIs to take the data that the customer has put in and put into their own CRM system. So engagement tools, effectively. Um, so we've raised that money and we're building out the team. Uh, we've already launched in um, America. So you can find us there at unbiased.com. And we're at unbiased.co.uk in the UK. And effectively, we're just providing the same service. There's lots more people in America. It's a huge opportunity for us. And as I say, we're exporting the best of unbiased in the UK over to the US. And we're going to leave anything that's not working perfectly here in the UK and learn about the US. Um, and for me, that's really exciting because actually we've got a mature business in the UK that's doing really well and generating profits. And now we've just raised some more money to sort of go and launch in a new land almost um, in the US where we don't know where we're going to fail yet, but I'm sure we will. Um, but it's very much like a new product launch, a new geography for us. Um, and that's exciting as well. I want to take, you mentioned the word failure and I want to, I want to sort of bring you back on that and talk a little bit more about you as a person and a businesswoman, if that's okay. Um, yeah. Because people love to hear um, about how, how it works, I think, on a personal level. So failure. A lot of people don't like the word failure. I actually quite like the word failure. I think it's something yeah. we need to acknowledge. Doesn't mean we can't learn just because we failed. Anyway, one of the things that you said about something that hadn't worked out well for you was a product launch, a product idea launched at the wrong time or to the wrong set of people. Um, yeah. And that your advice for that was to go back to your customer. Um, we, we, we only have a few minutes left, but if you can just give us a little bit of just just a little bit of a flavour about sort of 
perhaps a little bit about what went wrong um, yeah. and, and how you put it right. Yes, yeah, so um, it was some years ago. Um, I mean, look, there's, there's been lots of failures. Yeah, I've got a whole list of them. Um, I, I, and... I, I love to hear about people's <laughs> failures because I have a huge list of them as well. And our yeah. listeners love to hear about what's gone wrong because it's like, yes, OK, that, I tell you what, that was a, an utter disaster. But guess what? I'm still here. I did this. Yeah. This is what I learned. This is what happened. And this is where we now are. You are allowed to well, make yeah. failures. <laughs> and, and, and I think a lot of people in business, um, you know, just don't want to recognise that you know but i think if you do embrace it recognize it then it does help you you know become strong <laughs> oh it's forward. just one it's you know it's like doing something silly when you've had too much to drink they just style it out <laughs> the next morning you know and the, the bigger the failure you know you're just like right i just need to get on with life um, my biggest one actually look so when you mention the word there's what my my first big failure always just like comes into my brain i um i printed ten thousand pounds worth of um leaflets for in store for abbey national were putting a product out through Safeway supermarkets remember them I back do, at the time I do. and I um I know I know also old um and I got the telephone number wrong right simple rookie mistake and I remember someone saying to me you've wasted 10,000 pounds and I literally was ashamed and like oh my god like it wasn't the end of the world but it still really hurts yeah. to this day that that happened um, I don't actually, I've had bigger failures, way bigger failures, but none of them hurt as much as that one. Yeah, so, sometimes sometimes then, it's, 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 the, yeah. it, it's a peculiar impact, isn't it? Yeah. Um, um, back, to, back to the product one, though, that you asked me about. Um, so we tweaked the product and it was something around how when an inquiry is generated, we allow the advisor to either accept or reject it. Um, because we want them to really want that customer because then they give them a great service um, and they're much more incentivized to take them on as a client. Um, and something has happened where no one was involving this. And no, nothing was sort of getting accepted or rejected in the way that we, we thought it should be. Um, and if an advisor rejected the inquiry, it just meant that it moved on sooner to the next best match. And it was a good thing, but no one liked this reject button. Anyway, we did go back to the oh, customers yes. and said, why are you not... Um, why are you not using this? And it was just, it was new. They didn't know. The right people weren't looking at it. And it actually did take us, um, you know, we sent out some newsletters. We did get, we got our um, account managers on the phones and started talking to mm. some of our bigger customers. We did more around the, the education piece. So we knew it and we forgot that we know what's going on. And that actually we've got a whole swathe of customers here who we need to bring along for the journey. That was our failure, really. Um, lucky to say about three or four months after we launched it and it failed and we spoke to the customers and we did do some tweaks in, in the, um, on the platform around how it was badged up and colors and just simple mm. UX type things. But we'd also done this piece of education around this is how you use it. This is the benefit. Please use it because it actually helps the customers who we all want to come in and engage with their finances to find their way to the right advisor. So mm. it, there was a four-month sort of nail-biting wait to, to see yeah. the usage increase and then the platform start coming back as it should have. Um, these days, we have much quicker A-B tests, so we wouldn't launch things you know, as untested. Yeah. Um, and I also think as we've become more professional as a business, we have the luxury now of more testing. Back in the day when you're a bit scrappy, you're like, are we doing this or are we not? It's almost like pressing a big run bu red button. And yeah, off we're we gonna, go, yeah, we're going to do it and then we're going to watch and wait <laughs> and see. So, you know, luckily we don't do that so much. So the bigger the business, of course, the, the more careful yes. you need, need to be almost to... Um, not go backwards on anything you know it's always about going forward but you forget sometimes well you can lose a customer or you can get something wrong and it can be and it, the and detriment it, and, and it has a it has a huge impact because of um of, of the volume of of space that it takes up in your business what i want to do now karen if it's okay is we've spoken about a little bit about failure um i now want to talk about your superpower what's your superpower oh my gosh um this is an interesting one, but so I'm an introvert, um, naturally. So I think that watching and listening, funny enough, I mean, I do like to talk, don't get me wrong, when you talk, when I talk about something that I'm passionate about, but more and more and more, and almost the further I've become in my career, the more I am listening to what other people are saying and more closely, mm. um, and trying to really understand what are the points they're really wanting me to take from this. Um, and I think it comes from the fact that I can't do it all myself. 
you know, it may have set out that way, but I certainly can't do that now. I want people in my business to feel um, accountable and responsible and trusted to have the back of unbiased and do things as if it was their business. And they want to be proud of what they're accomplishing. They want to come to me and give me great ideas and for me to say, yes, go and do it, and then to come back and go, look, wasn't it a great success? So I think that listening to people and also managing people, you know, understanding how I can motivate and provide a vision for unbiased that brings all of the people we employ and that we talk to and our customers on that journey. You know, I have a vision that is a better world for people who are making financial decisions and I want them on that on that journey with me and behind me and helping us achieve that. So sorry, it's two answers to your one question, two superpowers, but try and listen closely and understand what motivates people to get them behind you and and work work well with you and for you so if we put that all together would that be your superpower is leadership oh maybe it is maybe it is it's something i certainly enjoy um you know i look at some people's roles in the business and just think gosh i could Mm. never do that you know getting deep in the data or you know the, the, it's a tough job sometimes talking to you know bringing new sales on etc so maybe i found my niche in, in leadership um i think that before i've been asked what are you good at um and i'm not particularly good at any one thing and i think that actually leadership for leadership that's great you know you yes, might have to do some yes, numbers yes. and budgeting <laughs> you might have to do some creative then you've got to do some pr or you know it's a whole mix and actually that suits me mm-hmm. i like dipping into different things and you know not being a master of any but generally of a good competency a a lot of things so just a couple of quick questions before we finish up what is your top tip for being in business oh top tip so confidence would be one in terms of you have a unique set of experiences and opinions and views Um, own that and understand that that's what makes you unique and people want unique people with that so particularly you know to the women who you know you mentioned imposter syndrome or don't feel confident um you know own that you're you're unique and that's important and people want that it's something something actively employers um or even you know entrepreneurs need employers need and entrepreneurs um, need to be so that would be one tip also you know, I think it's great as a woman. I've been able to get cut through, I think, or stand out because I've been different in our field. There's a lot of men um, in financial services and in technology. Um, and I found it really easy to get my opinions heard. It's given me a platform. So I think that networking, particularly with other women who have been through that, and finding yourself a mm. mentor for someone who's, who's where you want to be and simply ask. I, I know lots of people who are, really happy to you know pay it forward as it as it's called you know if they've got a time resource issue they can't give you everything they'll point you to the right sort of resources or books or they'll give you a leg up and it's it's very supportive environment i find you know women in finance and women in business uh, generally so it would be have the confidence have the courage of your conviction and also network support others and ask for help when you need it and one final question before we go. What do you know now that you wish you'd have known when you started out? Oh, well, I'm not big on regrets. You know, we all go through what we go through for a reason. But I think if I had understood access to funds earlier mm. and how that works, I definitely would have raised money and grown earlier, faster earlier. So that would be my answer there. Karen Barrett, CEO, founder of Unbiased. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing your journey. Thank you so much for sharing about your business. Just one final thing. I just want to make sure that people know how they can connect with you in both the UK and the USA because half of our listeners are in the States. Can you just give out your um, website details again so they can get hold of you? So in the UK, to find a financial advisor, it's unbiased.co.uk. And of course, there's lots of content and tools. So please do have a look. And in the US, it's unbiased.com. 
Oh, thank you so much. It's been lovely having you on the show. I hope that we're going to be able to get you back um, at another point, and hopefully in the studio. It's been a super, super interview. Thank you so much. I'm going to say goodbye from me. Goodbye from Laura. Goodbye. <laughs> thank you, Laura. Thank you, Sean. Thank I've had a great so time. Thank you so much. We will see Bye-bye. you. Bye-bye. We will see you soon. You take care. Thank you. Bye. Channel 2 Talk Radio. Tune in next week to the Women in Business radio show for more stories, ideas and inspiration to help you grow your business.